people have to live in, in unity. We are still in transition. Civil society has been decimated. Of course we rely on media. And I think the government has not done enough. The international community has failed to respond. No place in the world is perfect. Subscribe Tag TV YouTube channel and press the notification button. Hello viewers, welcome to Newspeak South Asia, a program that talks about breeding of terrorism and its impact on South Asian nations. Let's begin with the headlines first. Kashmir Valley inching towards peace as Indian Army continues to eliminate Pak Bhak terrorists. Blast in Pakistan's Karachi kills soldier, injures eight others. And violence continues unabated in Afghanistan amid peace talks with the Taliban. Up on their heels to demolish the cobweb of Pakistan-aided terrorism in Jammu and Kashmir. Indian security forces launched a counter-terrorism operation last week, neutralizing the commander of jesh e mohammed in Shopia district of the Union Territory. This comes as a major setback to Pakistan, which has been desperately trying to hamper peace and harmony in the region, but has failed repeatedly in the past few weeks. A counter-terrorism offensive aimed at wiping out Pak-back terrorists from Jammu and Kashmir has gained fresh momentum with the killing of two terrorists of jesh e Muhammad, including its commander Sajjad Afghani in the Shopia district. Earlier, another terrorist, identified as Jahangir Ahmad Wani of lashkar e taiba was also neutralized during the same operation. A change in strategy of operations by Indian security forces since last year has yielded it big breakthroughs. They are attacking the core, the leadership of the groups. The killings of wanted terrorists like Hezbollah commander Riaz Naiku, Lashkar commander Heda, Jesh commander Kari Yasir, and Ansar Gazwatul Hind Burhan Koka last year were the result of similar tactics. Today is the culmination of the all-out operations that were started by the security forces against all these militants to ensure that Kashmir Valley is cleared of all Pakistan-sponsored militants who are operating there. Now, along with this, what has happened is, apart from the security forces, the population of Kashmir they have risen against all these militants and they are the ones who are informing the security forces whenever they find any militant amongst their midst in the houses, taking shelter in the houses or anywhere else. Earlier it was not so. This change of mindset of the Kashmiri population is very, very significant because it is only after this change of mindset will the militancy be wiped out because moment a militant enters any house to take shelter, the Information is given to the Jammu Kashmir police, which in turn informs the security forces who come and carry out the operation. Frustrated by repeated failure in carrying out large-scale terror attacks, park back terror groups are now adopting new tactics from other theatres like recruiting and radicalising local youngsters, drones to drop weapons and drugs, tunnels for smuggling and introducing sticky bombs in Kashmir. In the recent development in Pakistan's terror strategy, two aircraft-shaped balloons bearing the Pakistan International Airlines logo PIA was seized inside the border area of Jammu and Kashmir, raising suspicions about Pakistan's possible attempt to spy on India. Although last month, India and Pakistan agreed to maintain peace and observe a strict ceasefire along the line of control on the security front, things are only deteriorating. The terror factories in Pakistan and along the Indo-Pak border in POK are continuing training modules and launch pads to push in terrorists in Kashmir. According to Indian forces, there are around 200 terrorists waiting in launch pads near the line of control to create havoc in the region. Abhi jo jahan par 200 ke kareeb tadad hai total jo terrorists is waqt active hain aur mujhe ummeed hai ki jaise pichle saal unki ginti pehle ke muqable mein kafi kam hui hai is saal aur bhi zyada kam hui hai Pakistan occupied Kashmir continues to be the safe haven 
for terrorists and extremists operating in the country. Not one or two, but a large number of terrorist camps thrive here. The gullible youth is indoctrinated in these camps only and then asked to infiltrate and unleash mayhem in India. Thousands of Kashmiris have died in a proxy war orchestrated by Pakistan and they continue to suffer due to terrorist groups patronized by the Pakistan military establishment. Kashmiri voices across the globe have urged the international community to take a serious note of Pakistan's atrocities on Kashmiris and have highlighted the use of terrorism by Islamabad as a foreign policy tool against them. Next, in 1989, it unleashed a policy of death and destruction by exporting terrorism into the Kashmir Valley. To this day, the Pakistani military establishment continues to patronize dozens of terrorist groups. Thousands of Kashmiris have died in this proxy war orchestrated by Pakistan. Madam President, unless the Prime Minister is held accountable for his words and pressed to give independence to Pakistan administered Jammu and Kashmir and Gilgit Baltistan, parts of my land which Pakistan occupies, the trivialization of the Jammu and Kashmir issue will only be further encouraged. Despite all the embarrassment and name-calling at various global forums, Pakistan continues to use terrorism as an instrument of its state policy. Pakistan's deep state, that is the army, has been indulging in malicious activities like infiltration and espionage to unleash mayhem in India. In a sophisticated world where the other countries are looking forward to establishing peace, harmony, and developing new technologies for the advancement of the world settlement, Pakistan's state policy of terrorism is causing violence and is creating an environment of distrust in the world. Moving on, a remote control bomb exploded this week in the Pakistani city of Karachi, killing one paramilitary soldier and injuring eight others. The attack was claimed by Baloch Liberation Army, a separatist outfit based in Balochistan province. The daylight violence not only exposes the country's internal security status, but also brings in reality the rise of separatist movement in the country. A bomb targeting a military vehicle exploded in Karachi city, killing a paramilitary soldier and injuring eight others. The Baloch Liberation Army, BLA, claimed responsibility for the terror attack in the city's congested Orangi town, which was carried out through a bomb planted on a parked motorcycle. The bomb was detonated when a Pakistani ranger's vehicle passed through the area. The BLA, which demands for a free Balochistan, has carried out several attacks on Pakistani security forces in the past. Pakistan's internal law and order situation remains a matter of concern as besides mushrooming of terror groups, the separatist movement has gained momentum. Violence of various forms including murder, extortion, kidnappings and terror attacks are common in the Islamic nation. The Baloch have been very oppressed by the Pakistan state. The incorporation of Balochistan into Pakistan itself is very dubious. What Pakistan has done is the following. Pakistan has looted Balochistan's natural resources and as a result of which the Baloch people have been left in poverty. So there's a paradox. Balochistan is minerally very rich. It doesn't have water resources but minerally it's very very rich but its people are extremely poor and whenever they have tried to make demands for justice to be done to them, the Pakistan state has uh, has behaved very ham-handedly and with a very uh, with the use of great degree of force and oppression. And therefore, it is only natural that the Baloch would take up arms. Balochistan is a resource-rich but least developed province of Pakistan, where a movement for freedom is ongoing for the past several decades. The BLA is the largest and the oldest surviving separatist group in the region that has been raising the demand for an independent Balochistan. Their core grievance is that the Pakistani state has been exploiting resources in Balochistan without giving due share to the province itself. In response to this legitimate demand, the security agencies in Pakistan are eliminating the Baloch people through their kill and dump policy, enforced disappearances, 
tortures and killings. That's how Pakistan tries to crush dissent in Balochistan. Time and again, Baloch people have urged the international community to protect them from the Pakistan army's death squads, which have turned the land of resources into the land of missing people. In Balochistan, you, you will find worse kind of subjugation, worse kind of colonization. You cannot imagine how Pakistan army is brutally killing, abducting and keeping the people under subjugation. So there's not a one uh, area, one field where you can say that the, these are being treated as human beings. On one side, we see there are military operations where the Pakistani army forces, they cordon off an area and they, then they start their military operation with helicopter guns, with uh, killing the people extrajudicially and looting the resources of the houses and eliminating the people. Uh, all that, uh, that is being done uh, uh, on a routine basis. On the second side, we see that the people are being uh, victim of enforced disappearances. The indiscriminate exploitation of Balochistan's natural resources by Pakistan without caring for the welfare of its people have provided the Baloch a very strong ideological foundation to oppose Islamabad's undemocratic practices. There are several other separatist groups in Balochistan. They are Balochistan Republican Army, Balochistan Liberation Front, United Baloch Army, Lashkar e Balochistan, Baloch Republican Guard. Besides Pakistan, these Baloch revolutionists have been frequently targeting Chinese installations and have strongly opposed the Belt and Road Initiative, especially its investment in Balochistan. Since the beginning of these projects, there has been an influx of foreigners, especially Chinese nationals in the region, triggering major concerns among locals. They fear that CPEC will turn the Baloch people into a minority. What are these projects? What is CPEC? Whether this is a development project or some sort of uh, specific military designs, only you are giving some benefits to the uh, foreigners, Chinese. For them, you are building very good houses. For them, you have water facilities. For them, you have uh, sports uh, uh, centers for them. But for the local people, you are not even uh, giving them uh, water. And, and on the other side, our education system is worst of that. Over the decades, the Pakistani army has ruthlessly crushed the aspirations of the people of this mineral-rich province and committed massive human rights violations, including forced disappearances, targeted killings, and implemented a policy of ethnic domination by the Punjabi culture and language in the area. The violence unleashed by Baloch nationalists are a repercussion of the atrocities being meted out on the ethnic group. Hence. In order to contain the worsening situation, it is high time Pakistan should mend its ways and put a full stop to its inhuman treatment of the Baloch people. Peace process is taking place between the Taliban and Afghan government, but it is unclear if and when it might result in a resolution. The dialogue has come against the backdrop of a significant surge in violence. Continuous attacks have raised the concerns regarding the vulnerable situation of Afghanistan amidst the revival of predatory groups on its soil. This week, four people were killed and nine others wounded when a roadside bomb hit a bus carrying Afghan government employees in Kabul. The bus was rented by the Afghan Ministry of Information and Technology to transport employees. In a separate incident, a helicopter crash overnight took the lives of at least nine people, including a pilot and five security force members. Sose said the helicopter was hit by a rocket during takeoff in central Maidan, Wardak province. It was not clear who fired the rocket, and there have been no claims of responsibility for the crash as well as for the attack on government bus. But the Afghan government has blamed Taliban insurgents for recent attacks targeting government employees, civil society figures, and journalists. However, the Taliban has denied any involvement in the campaign. The bombing comes on the day the Afghan government, Taliban, and key countries, including the United States and Russia, gathered in Moscow 
to push for a reduction in violence to propel the Afghan peace process forward. In According to a report released by the UN Assistance Mission in Afghanistan and the UN Human Rights Office in February, there has been a significant rise in civilians killed and injured in Afghanistan following the start of peace negotiations in September. The report says that the overall number of civilian casualties in 2020 is 8,820. The report detailed the impact on Afghan women and children. They make up 43% of all casualties, 30% were children and 13% women. The anti-government elements in 2020 caused the majority of civilian casualties, which is 62%, totaling 5,459 casualties, 1,885 killed and 3,574 injured, with the Taliban responsible for most of these casualties, which is 45% of the total, and Daesh responsible for 8%. They have been killing civilians and government personnel alike. People narrating horrific tales have become an everyday incident. و وقتی که بر آمدم از بام از وظیفه خود این طرف که آمدم انفجار آمد کل ما طرف طرف برگشتیم سعی کردیم که کاستر از مامورین کل سر صدا بسار وضعیت وقیب کل مردم در اندال انتظار هستند دو ساعت یک ساعت نمیتونم به طرف خانه خود برن موترای ساعت را بندان بسار دیگه جای تحصف است The Afghan government and Taliban militants with the U.S. support have been carrying out talks in the hope of reaching a peace deal after decades of violent conflict. In line with the preliminary deal agreed by the U.S. before talks between the Afghan government and Taliban began in Doha, the U.S. will withdraw its troops from the country by May 1. However, the U.S. President Joe Biden cast doubt on this as a possibility, saying, that the removal of the remaining 2,500 U.S. troops would be tough. The Taliban has warned that the world will face a dangerous war, a war that never happened in the past 20 years if the U.S. failed to uphold its end of the agreement. While Afghanistan is reeling under constant bloodshed, Observers around the world are raising concerns over the security situation in Afghanistan as well as the entire South Asia. Recently, the European Foundation for South Asian Studies also highlighted the possible trajectories of terrorism in South Asia post-US withdrawal from Afghanistan. In a webinar held on the sidelines of the 46th session of the United Nations Human Rights Council. As the May 1 deadline to withdraw U.S. troops from the country approaches, experts and diplomats have raised concerns over the Taliban becoming more powerful after the withdrawal of the United States and NATO forces from Afghanistan. Recently, in a webinar held on the sidelines of the 46th session of the United Nations Human Rights Council, UNHRC, Experts spoke about the strategic implications of the U.S. withdrawal from Afghanistan. There are apprehensions that the withdrawal of foreign troops will nevertheless not end fighting in Afghanistan, but would cause a drawn-out civil war. Based on this strategic analysis, Dr. Michael O'Hanlon suggested that a full withdrawal of the U.S. from Afghanistan is unlikely to materialize and specially described the withdrawal date of 1st May 2021 as unrealistic. I believe that if the United States and NATO pulled out, there would not be a rapid resolution, uh, either in terms of negotiation or in terms of fighting. You would have a war that would probably get even worse than it is right now. And the cities of Afghanistan would start to be much more vulnerable. What I believe will happen, even though it would be tragic, would be a form of ethnic cleansing. 
Observers have also raised concerns over the potential risk on the nuclear stability of the region, posed by the presence of U.S. military in Afghanistan. Nuclear terrorism is an overarching term that ranges from building improvised explosive devices, IEDs, and using nuclear devices not only through radiological materials like plutonium or uranium, but also medical materials. The danger of nuclear terrorism also includes terrorist groups using it as a threat to convince its enemy that they are in possession of such materials and are willing to use against them. Afghanistan is not the most uh, developed country in terms of using nuclear power in this region. And in terms of the nuclear facilities, uh, there are uh, neighboring uh, Pakistan, uh, India, Kazakhstan, uh, Russia, China. And uh, so in this way, I would like that to say that in the same way as uh, Afghanistan is positively described as a center, potential center of a transport hub for the large, uh, for, for the large Eurasian region, in the same way, uh, Afghanistan may be used as a point where the transport route of illegal stuff uh, may meet or uh, may be used by uh, illicit uh, actors and groups uh, for uh, criminal or terrorist purposes. The Taliban today undoubtedly has a stronger hold over how the U.S. military plans to withdraw from the conflict in Afghanistan. Critics argue that the Taliban has not yet cut ties to Al-Qaeda and other terrorist groups, as the February 2020 agreement called for. This raises question about the continuing challenges to security in South Asia, in particular, the influence of Islamic State of Khorasan and its rise both as an ISIS-aligned entity and a Big Ten brand for various jihadist groups in the country. And with that, we come to the end of this edition of Newsweek South Asia. We'll be back next week with more news, views and analysis from the subcontinent. Meanwhile, do keep writing to us at nwsa at nin.com. This is Shreya Savage signing off on the behalf of entire production team of Newsweek South Asia. Goodbye and take care.